Hello everybody and welcome to OEG's latest webinar. For those of you who celebrate it, we've helpfully scheduled this on Valentine's Day um, to act as a little reminder. For those of you who haven't yet bought a card and um, those of you who celebrate it, please remember to do so. Um, you'll thank me later. Okay, back to business. Um, we're halfway through February already, uh, which is a bit scary, and we're back with OEG's second webinar of the year. And we're bringing you something a little bit different today. Um, we just have a few slides, um, uh, and really today the main focus is going to be a discussion with our panel. So without further ado, um, let me introduce them. First up, our serial uh, webinar uh, attendee, um, host slash speaker, um, OEG's Chief Analyst, John Grant. Welcome back, John. Hello, Deidre. Serial attendee, it sounds like some horror sky movie it does, type doesn't thing, it? doesn't it? Thanks for calling me that. I think I'm, I'm, my name just, today is John Senior, I believe. John Senior, I'll try and remember that. Okay, just, I, th I thought I would just get the bad stuff out of the way first. Um, now moving on to the good things. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we um, probably little introduction needed, I guess, for our... Um, uh, our second guest, uh, who is Eddie Pianzek. Eddie, welcome back, um, Head of Advisory at ISCA. Always a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you, Deirdre. Pleasure to be here. Good, good. And um, we've got some new faces uh, joining us um, today as well. We're delighted to be joined by uh, Mark Dunahy. Um, Mark is the SVP commercial at ACIA Aero Leasing. Um, Mark's got a long background. Uh, I'm sure he's not too disappointed at me saying that um, in the aviation industry and in particular in the regional jet market, um, having worked at Embraer for almost two decades and prior to that BAE, BAE Systems. Um, and more recently, Mark, you were head of commercial at ATR um, and you've now jumped over the fence. Is it a fence? Is yes, it a I've, I've, I've gone back fence to the, the dark side, I think, is the explanation or the uh, the way people call it. But uh, yes, that's correct, dear Jane. And great to be with you all today. Thank you. Well, welcome. And we we'll look forward to, to hearing from you. Um, and last, but of course, by no means least, um, welcome to um, John Huey, John. who I think we're going to refer as John Jr. Um, during uh, during the webinar. He's, he's happy about that. Um, John is head of aviation risk at Calc, um, a major aircraft leasing uh, company. And John um, has almost two decades of experience in aviation leasing. So we're really looking forward to hearing um, some of your insights uh, and, and the benefit of your experience today, John. Welcome. Thank you, Adrian. Slightly starstruck in this exalted podcast company, but looking forward to it. <laughs> Great. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll we'll break you in gently. Okay. Um, let's just take a look then at um, what we're going to talk about today. So um, we've been hearing uh, for some time now that um, aircraft lease rates have um, perhaps never been higher, but they're very high. Um, we also know that there are huge challenges in terms of the delivery of aircraft um, there are significant orders that have been placed and continue uh, to be placed at the back end of last year. Um, and it's fair to say demand for new aircraft has never been higher. Um, we've got an increase in lease rates um, because of some of the things that are happening in the industry in terms of maintenance and the timeframes for that. Um, so we wanted to really just explore this 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 subject and understand that relationship perhaps between, um, is there a relationship in fact between um, the, the changes in aircraft lease rates and airfares and demand? Um, and then what's going to happen? How, how are things going to pan out for the rest of this year and into next year? Um, should airlines pass on costs from increased lease rates or should they take a hit on profits? Um, especially in a, in a high fare uh, environment. Um, I'm sure we'll cover this and uh, much, much more as we go. So, um, John, we've squeezed in a little capacity slide here, um, which is just, and here, here we are, you, you, uh, you're taking responsibility for this. You've sneaked in 2019 um, as, as a measure here. Um, and we've sort of said, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to move past that, but I think it does bear relevance it does. It, um, to, to show what's happening um, across the different... Yeah, sorry, I, I, 
I, I couldn't get away from 2019. It is, it is a reference point, and I think we sometimes need to go back to it. But um, if and if we do go all the way back to 2019, there are there are actually some parts of the world that are still in the first quarter of this year below uh, first quarter levels in 19, um, of which uh, Western Europe is one of them. Um, you know, we're still languishing at minus four percent of capacity. Um, on the back, primarily, I think, of what's been happening in France and in Germany in terms of reductions in domestic services, um, government uh, requirements regarding use of other modal travel forms, particularly high-speed trains. Um, and when Germany loses uh, somewhere like 25% of its capacity versus 2019, it has an impact and, and ripples throughout the rest of Europe because it, it hits the other end of the route or a country market. So that's frustrating. And you know, another one that's notably down is Southern Africa, where we um, sadly saw the demise of South African Airways and a couple of other carriers during the pandemic, and that's not recovered fully. Uh, so, yeah, there's there, you know there are some soft spots, Southeast Asia um, still still struggling to get back to normal mm. uh, and yet if we look against last year there are some really positive messages out there and there are some very strong bounce backs um northeast asia where china has you know and continues to slowly um be reopening and of course this is the week of the chinese new year there's 20 percent more capacity this week uh this quarter than there was in um 2023 so so that's good um and similarly in uh, places like the southwest pacific and in the caribbean um strong growth year on year in fact probably too much growth in some markets um i'm sure we'll come on to it but i'm increasingly nervous about some of the growth we see in north america at the moment um rumblings from some carriers about you know slightly too much capacity um is it is is that revenge spend are we beginning to see all of these um descriptors come to an end and we get back to more normal trading conditions so yeah it's it, it's fascinating Deirdre. it always is there are winners and losers in all of this and, and i think for everyone um you know there are places where um, there remain opportunities, but equally, um, we've got a couple of warning signs coming along us as, a, as an industry. Um, and some of the issues we're going to touch upon during the webinar are, I think, absolutely crucial to, to how 2024 and even into 26 will perform. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that you know, in, a, in what is a mature market. North America's sort of been the, maybe not the bellwether, but the, the measure, hasn't it, of a market that got back to recovery, um, partly because of the size of the, the domestic market and the work that has taken place over the, the, the past decade and longer in terms of consolidation uh, of carriers. So um, it's, it's interesting to see, isn't it, that it has now recovered beyond 2019, and and we're you know are we teetering on the edge of of overcapacity potentially? Yeah, and you know we always we always said that the pandemic every country every continent had its own event and circumstances and the US was broadly ahead of everyone else in the recovery. Um, but now you you know you've got an environment where the economy is is soft um, and inflation isn't coming down as quickly as they expected. We've got some new airline entrants. We've got more capacity coming in. Um, we've got expansion of international services from um, the big three into Europe this summer again. So it, there's a whole host of things. We've got the regulator blocking the JetBlue Spirit merger. You know, uh, Hawaiian have um, been on sort of, if not quite walking into the intensive care unit, they've been st uh, just outside for some time. So it's... Um, if that's a precursor to what we're going to see in other parts of the world, then, you know, we're in for some careful airline management, despite all the challenges. Uh, and that feels a bit gloomy, doesn't it? Uh, well, either that or I can tell you it's pouring down with rain. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<laughs> we waive our we, we regular right. uh, regular listeners uh, will will know that we um we we, we sort of waver between uh, um a degree of optimism and, and doom and gloom, don't we? Uh, on this, as we as yeah, we it's not comfortable, it's not comfortable. <laughs> I mean, in terms of leasing in 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 the US, um, I'm right in saying this is this is not the main geography, is it? Where where leasing aircraft is 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 heavily is heavily used, is it? There's there are bigger markets elsewhere, um, and that's just about sheer sheer volume and scale of of operators, isn't it? That's probably a question for Eddie. Is that? That's for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, I mean, in the U.S. market, is especially um, the airlines there, especially. I mean, the big majors, etc. They they do lease, but they've also benefited from having strong cash flows. They can afford to buy aircraft off their own bat um, and maybe do some refinancings later on. But yeah, I mean, leasing, a, and I guess Mark and Mark and John can elaborate on that. Is you know. Europe, Asia, rest of the world kind of markets as well is, is, is where most activity is happening there. And it's attractive, isn't it, from, from an airline perspective? Because it, you know, I guess the parallel is is um, you know, you know, to me in, in a sort of simplistic way, is leasing or buying a car. You either have a big capital outlay and then the, the associated depreciation and running costs. Or um, you know you you have the the lease or the rental payments and and um, it's never your asset but was was it ever going to be your asset anyway um, and and maybe that is too simplistic but we've seen I guess we've seen the the lease market in other areas property um, cars uh, you know equipment um, have have boom times um, are we seeing the same in in the aviation industry this is an attractive, attractive direction for airlines to go in um dear just to, to jump in um uh, I, I think you know we all saw the uh, godfather of leasing you know steve hazy a couple of weeks ago in dublin um you know and he was pointing out that we're now at about 50 percent um of the airline uh, capacity is leased and it's going to grow and it's going to grow to potentially 55, 60%. Um, you know, the, the rationale used to be that you would potentially, you know, own about a third of your fleet and, and the rest would be leased or, or vice versa. But um, clearly, you know, when you look at the number of players in the space uh, right across the spectrum, it's it's still very much a, a growth industry. Um, and you, you saw that in Dublin. We were just talking before about, you know, 5,500 delegates attending the... Um, the aviation conference a couple of weeks ago is is unheard of and i guess that's what's interesting is we were talking um with you eddie last week about and that is in a context where lease rates are going up, are going isn't up. It? Exactly. you know interest rates are driving up the cost of um the cost of everything but but specifically the cost of um of leasing well yeah i mean there's there's so many variables at play in the whole leasing and the airline business but yeah part of it is just down to getting capacity um, I mean we all saw uh, or we all know about you know the problems that airlines have with kind of flying the Pratt Whitney powered A320 family um, a lot of aircraft are being stood down you know temporarily but for a fair period of time they need replacing the manufacturers are struggling to build aircraft as fastly as as, as quickly as, as as people need aircraft um so there's delays there so that's building up uh, a fair bit of pent-up demand for 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 aircraft to, to, to fill those gaps and you can't just go to the to the deserts and pull something out, out, out to the desert because there's also a an mro queue a backlog of getting aircraft overhauled engines overhauled and it's an expensive process too so the actual pool of aircraft available is is not as big as people might imagine, and therefore the price goes up. It's a inevitability of supply and demand, I guess. But I think that's the, the crux of it as well. Right? I mean, the, the buy versus lease debate is, is probably become a bit of a false narrative just because leasing companies control so much of the supply. I mean, it is over 50% now. We're an important financing channel for new aircraft. So, so really, when you're an airline of any particular scale, it's not buy or lease, it's, it's buy and lease. 
Yeah. And we're having discussions you know, on a daily basis with airlines that, that typically would have preferred to own assets and probably have the balance sheets to own assets, but simply need need the leasing channel to secure the metal for the growth plans. So that's certainly driving what we're seeing now. And I guess you've got that twin track, haven't you, that, that you alluded to, Eddie, of decisions about long-term fleet development, but also this short-term issue that the industry is having in terms of money, um, MRO uh delays that's that's pushing people into the wet lease um or the damp lease market um so so that maybe that's muddying the waters a little if that's not too too unclear of an of an analogy um that you know you've you've got a sort of short term short to medium term issue maybe um that's sitting alongside a a a, a path to a different type of um, ownership or a different ownership model yeah, well, I guess, again, I mean, it's just a case of getting access to to aircraft. I mean, uh, there is this short term element in terms of replacing what can't be flown at the moment. Oh. Now, I mean, some people have suggested that that could go till the end of the decade, especially with, again, manufacturers still ramping up on, on production. Other people seem to think it's maybe only two or three years that we're going to have that kind of a uh, near term demand. So, again, there's. It, it's a mixed picture in terms of how people are perceiving the next few years going forward. I um I I attended a conference last week and I was listening to some pretty major airlines around Europe and they were it's it's almost incredible that eight weeks before the summer season they do not have a complete picture of what they're going to fly and what mm. assets are going to be available to them or what aircraft are going to be delivered and it. When you think about how that ripples through the whole planning environment for airports, for staff recruitment, for rostering, um, it, it just seems to me that that we've we've just lost control of it. Have we lost control of of the supply chain, or or are there just so many factors that we can't we can't control them all? In, in what sense, John, do you mean lost control? Well, we just, we don't have that clarity. We don't have that visibility. You know, we, we for some, for a big airline like um, Wiz to be ground in anything up to 40 aircraft this summer because of the Pratt & Whitney issue, for Ryanair to be saying, I might start a base somewhere in Europe, but I can't tell you at the moment because I don't know if the 10 aircraft I'm expecting to arrive are going to arrive. You know, is there, is there... Where do you point the finger to all of this? I mean, it's and there's nowhere else to go, is it? You can't you can't go anywhere else other than these two guys, really. To me, it's it's almost like you know, it's um, you know, perfect storm, um, but kind of in a sweet spot where you know, I agree with John, it comes to uh, younger John and older John, yeah, okay, (laughs) on this point, um, it is a a supply and demand uh, issue, you know, some of the the stats, you know, when I was seeing that there's there's over 400 A320s grounded because of the Pratt and Whitney problems. I mean, that is just uh, amazing. Um, you know, people at Indigo uh, sitting with grounded fleet, a huge demand from the traveling public, um, chasing limited number of aircraft. I saw Paul Dowdy there in the chat was asking about, you know, how many aircraft are mothballed, and this is always a, a huge debate, but there are not many. Um, and, you know, some of the stats are suggesting uh, the pond is drying up even more. You know, it's a bit like everyone in the Sahara, whatever the Kalahari is, coming to the watering hole uh, to discover the watering hole is drying up fast. Uh, and that's right across the board, you know, whether it's the, um, the PAX uh, jets or in the regional segment where we are. Um, you know, some of the, the ATRs we, we have available, which is kind of our sweet spot in the regional, we have at least four to five serious prospects chasing every airplane. Uh, that is really quite staggering. Yeah? And that changes wow. the dynamic, doesn't it, Mark? Of, of It changes the balance of power, doesn't it, in terms of the, the relationship um, here, which my, my, my take, um, I guess, sort of being slightly on the outside, was always that the balance of power laid with the airline um, in terms of dictating, you know, putting out RFPs for, um, for aircraft, 
dictating terms or having power in in the negotiation. But that you're describing an environment where um, perhaps the lessors can afford to be um, more choosy about who they do business with and oh, absolutely. Uh, more mindful of the terms uh, in, in terms of them being um, perhaps more balanced than they were in the past. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, John can probably talk to this on the larger aircraft, but, um, you know, the ability to, to really choose carefully where you put your assets even more than you did before. Um, I would never be, you know, to assume that airlines have no choice is a dangerous uh, conclusion, and I would never assume that. And at the end of the day, unless the airlines are, are taking aircraft and growing, um, most of us around this table aren't going to be doing an awful lot. So we, we all depend on, on the airlines as the central process, but um, certainly it's it's readjusting the balance. You know, when you can get uh, the chairman of an airline that you know you're negotiating with on capacity to actually admit publicly that lease rates are going up is a huge achievement. We may not agree on by how much, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, it's a big, a big break because um, it's the reality of the, the market today. John, perhaps you can talk to the larger aircraft better. No, I mean, we're seeing the same thing. I mean, for you, I suppose, Mark, you've got very low transition costs, so it's, it's even easier to move to move aircraft around at, at lease end, but we're definitely seeing the same thing. Uh, look, you have to you have to bear in mind that you're talking about a long relationship with, exactly. with your airline customers. So an, an aircraft that we sign up on lease today probably gets delivered maybe in two years from now, and it goes on lease for 12 years. So that's a 14-year relationship. So you always have to bear that in mind. But there's no doubt that we have more power as lessors than we probably had at, at any time in that I can remember. So we're seeing, you know, we're able to go up the credit spectrum. We're able to move aircraft to, uh, to, to less risky propositions and we're able to get terms that we wouldn't have got before and not, not only higher lease rates, but better security packages and, and things like that. So it, it's, it's certainly acting in the favor of, of lessors at the moment. We're seeing that too. It's the challenge of a cyclical industry, though, though, isn't it? You know, I, I think we've probably all lived through those those cycles and know that just just as this is how it appears just now, um, two, three, four years on from now, the landscape might, might look quite different. Um, is there is there pressure? I wonder then for lease lengths to shorten. Um, or, no, or I'd say it's I'd say it's the opposite. I mean, the you're, opposite. yeah, we'd we'd be more inclined to say, look, um, people are are ready to tie in for longer. Mm -hmm. um, that's certainly the trend we're seeing. I don't know about you, John. No, absolutely. I mean, if you're talking about higher numbers, then you, you can soften that blow by leasing for a longer period of time. So, you know, there there are certain accounting implications around doing that in some places. But yes, we we'd see the same thing. Uh, and then you, know, you have to then bear in mind exactly what you said, Deirdre, it is cyclical and part of what my team does is trying to to price in the risk of that. Uh, and you've always got the possibility that at some point in time, things will change. Um, you know, getting getting $500,000 a month now is not the same as a promise of one in 10 years from now. So mm -hmm. you have to be kind of careful how you how you price and manage that. But yeah, the trend is towards lengthening terms for that, for that reason. And I Are guess you... Sorry, all of this... Yeah, I was going to say, all of this is quite interesting because it makes you think, if you actually are an airline and you are, you own all of your own fleet, as one gentleman constantly reminds everyone when he gets a chance, um, you're in a pretty good space at the moment, aren't you? Yes, no, you, you, you really are. And we, we talked about this previously, John. I mean, you know, really where you want to be right now is a significant number of aircraft on balance sheet preferably unencumbered. If you're a good credit, you can access cheaper funds to finance. Uh, and then you can use leased aircraft to flex the fleet up and down. And, and some airlines are, are very good at, at doing that. Um, mm. So, you know, if you look at an airline like this, a big one up the road from me right here, um, they're very, very well set to do that because they have a massive number of unencumbered assets. They're not going to have lessors coming at them, trying to take aircraft away. They've got that flexibility. So, yeah, no, you're exactly right. So do, do the big get bigger and the rest struggle? struggle. So I think that, that particular airline has always had an advantage in terms of its, of its fleet cost, but that is uh -huh. going to become even more pronounced because they've got that competitively priced order book coming and they've got the flexibility of the aircraft on balance sheet. So the aircraft ownership unit cost advantage that, that they and airlines like them have is, is going to become even more significant. 
And do you see that in the ATR market in the mark? In or is it more lease still? Look, um, the, the regional sector is so uh, price sensitive, you know, and the fares, um, oh. the market challenges that I, I'd say it's it's perhaps a little bit more, um, you know, people could, could easily walk away and say, look, and, unless, you know, the lease makes sense for me and I'm going to make money, uh, I'll just bite the bullet and won't, won't expand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, you know, whereas perhaps on, on the larger aircraft, you're taking a longer term view, but, you know, a lot of our customers, it's, it's, uh, it's a daily challenge for them, as you well know, John, um, so to make money. Maybe slightly more churn in the regional market. It's certainly, uh, it's certainly a faster dynamic. Um, you know, the people coming through the door expect aircraft like now, um, but that's always been the case in the regional. It's it's not so much the long term planning that you would see, you know, when you think on on the, you know, the jets, uh, the fact that the manufacturers are kind of sold out for the next five to six years. You know, if you go to Toulouse and knock on ATR's door, they'll still be able to, to find you a delivery slot. You know, maybe squeeze one in this year, but certainly next year. Um, so that's a very different dynamic. And same thing with Embraer. If you go there, I'm sure. They would have a, a few slots to play around with, so it's it's a different uh, dynamic. So all of this. So all is, of this. Oh, I've got that one. Oh, sorry, everybody. Um, but all of this must be having an impact on the um, the second-hand market for aircraft, both leasing and, and purchase, uh, doesn't it? I know you, um, you um, have some uh, lease um, lease market lease leases market lease rates and um, um, current market yeah, current market. for aged aircraft um, compared to new build yeah. aircraft um, and I'll put that slide up now. Um, hopefully you can all see that. Um, and that kind of shows an interesting picture, doesn't it? Sort of considerable yeah, sort of um, across these narrow body um, uh, and wide body aircraft um, to some extent. Want to just uh, talk to us a little about about that? Yeah, I mean, we we track obviously the, the values and lease rates of of aircraft here. We've got two tables. One, the top one shows you the the new builds and how the values have moved. Again, we'd be harking back to Jan twenty just to give a little bit of context of where we've been since then. Now, obviously, we we can't we don't show here the. Uh, the values in 21 and 22 when when they were down, but we're showing the improvement in 23 and, and how it's going so far in 24. Um, but I mean, these these are what we'd call uh, unencumbered assets. So this is trying to place an aircraft uh, uh, on on lease. I mean, one of the things we've we've actually noticed recently, I was looking at the the aircraft that were returning off lease in in uh, in January. And you know, there's a handful of you know A319s, and you know perhaps some of the the smaller, uh, more more niche aircraft types. But A320s, 737-800s, not many at all. And what we're seeing there is a lot of lease extensions. So because airlines aren't aren't getting the new aircraft on time, they're extending the leases of aircraft that they were probably thinking of rolling over at some stage. So there's a there's a market there for lease extensions. In terms of new deliveries, um, again, that's you know the values have gone up, the lease rates have gone up, but there's a there's an element of competition between lessors to to win that business. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Deirdre, about you know the RFPs going out, and you know sometimes there's there's dozens of lessors bidding on those things. They get shortlisted, and you know quite often it's the you know the lowest rental or the best terms in the relationship that wins out. So there's there's competition which is perhaps holding back some of that, that lease rate on, on new deliveries. But then there's also mm -hmm. a, a, a legacy, a, a mix of different, you know, aircraft currently on lease, which are coming off lease. And some of them were done before COVID, some of them were done during COVID. They're at different lease rates, you know, just to reflect the market conditions at the time. So there's, there's a whole swathe of different um, uh, activities going on there. But generally speaking, for most of the types, you know, the lease rates have been improving year on year, last couple of years. Um, and 
that would probably continue to do so as long as the airlines can afford to uh, can afford to pay. I guess there are issues, aren't there, with um, lease extensions in terms of um, aging aging aircraft. Um, you know, and and th th there therein sort of lies another um, a another factor, I suppose, in um, operational reliability, taking time taking time out for MRO. Um, so so it's you know there's there's there are challenges in lots of directions, and and also in in all of those things that you know we've been looking for new aircraft to help us with sustainability credentials, carbon emissions, all of these sort of things. If we're continuing to use slightly older aircraft, does that mean, you know, we're taking a bit of a step backward in, in hitting our targets? Um, the amount of airlines when they get new aircraft who then spend months extolling the 20% the cheaper operating cost, et cetera, et cetera, and not getting those 20% benefits anymore is keeping those aircraft actually you know it's a necessity now but it's potentially a bit of a burden further down the stream um or or are these leases just so short term that in two years time three years time they'll go away well maybe i can go they're certainly not short term i mean even even off extensions you know, where you would have been talking about a short term lease you're talking about significantly longer terms than you would have been so that that's going to be locked in. Locked in. I, I think the sustainability point point you raise is is really interesting, actually, because there is there is a dynamic there. I mean, not only the fact that we haven't built several thousand aircraft that should have been built over that intervening period, but traffic has gotten back to pretty much where it was pre-COVID capacity, roughly the same as where it was pre-COVID. So that tells you that the average age of the operating fleet has to be older than we would have expected it to be three or four years ago. So I, I haven't dug into what that really is going to mean, but it's certainly not a good thing in terms of, of trying to hit those you know, net zero targets. That's, that's, that's for certain. But, uh, you know, I think we, um, we got a bit carried away by this whole euphoria of, you know, green flying or greener flying and new technology. Um, you know, we spoke a little bit about this um, a couple of weeks ago on, on one of the panels at, at Dublin um, with the uh, the lessors and, and the OEMs. And uh, you know, I was I was making the comment it, it was not so long ago you just get a group of millennials, a leather sofa, and an industrial warehouse, and, and launch a, an aerospace program. I mean, this is a complex industry. A lot of the things out there, with all due respect, we just do not believe are are viable to get certificated within the time frame people are talking about or look at the problems that boeing are having in their uh, you know strong pedigree manufacturer <laughs> with a, yeah. a long history and they're struggling um, so the idea you can come along with new technology it will come but it's it's further down the curve um so i think this has probably done us all a favor with a reality check as people have focused back on business and what is business? Well, it's it's a growing market. More and more people flying, regardless of how you look at it. Um, uh -huh. You know, Steve put out uh, some some comments the other day, and he, he said there was this year 4.7 billion one-way packs projected, and by 2030 we'll be at six billion passengers. So even if you factor in, you know, slowing markets, whatever, people are traveling and traveling like crazy. And that's right across the board. So demand is going to be there. And the supply chain isn't keeping up. Um, so I, I think we're, you know, John, you you and I talked a little bit about this before in terms of are, are there some clouds coming over the horizon? They're certainly not um, in the immediate horizon. I think we're, we're going to have a, a good 24. And as long as supply chain issues run through to 25, it's going to keep a damper on on any sort of negative uh, flows through to the market. That, that's at least my view. I don't know how the rest of you feel. I think what's interesting, if you think about this in the context of population, and it, you sort of alluded to that, to that mark, that, you know, we know that there are um, countries with ageing populations and that will have a, a bit of break on demand for those countries. But the populations that are the countries that are experiencing growth and have younger populations 
are significantly bigger. And so the, the net position is, is going to be st strong growth. I think we also perhaps didn't um, really appreciate um, just how important travel is as an enabler of all sorts of things, whether that's visiting friends and relatives, yeah. um, whether it's you know taking leisure travel or, or for business purposes. And I think how we, I think what we've seen in terms of behaviour um, and the prioritisation of travel, um, and you know the the all of the things that are now beyond the that awful revenge spend uh, phrase that again we just need to put in the bin um the travel patterns ha have changed i i think and this is a broad generalization but we are seeing people prioritizing um the the trips and i don't think it's just a specific generational thing i think we're seeing that across across all all, all age groups but is is the current supply challenge going to suppress those emergent markets where we know price is you know the greatest stimulant for air travel particularly in the low-cost airline sector and we you know we we have numerous examples of where country markets have exploded because there's been more competition um there's been more disposable income everything's been aligned to encourage that to happen but airfares now are in many markets, considerably higher than they were in 2019 and are sticking at those prices and they're going to stick. Let's not forget that. And and we're not yet really, you know, there are regulators, governments, whoever, who still see aviation as a soft target and are looking to impose further taxation. Is that going to is that going to? soften what would otherwise be the natural demand that we would expect to see. The cost, the cost pressures are all up. No, no question about that. I don't think it's particularly a function of, of lease rates and the asset cost. That's probably about 10% 10, 10 of an airline's total cost. So in and of itself, that's, that's not all of it. But apart from fuel, pretty much everything else is pushing upwards. So you've got you know, cost of labor, particularly in the US, pushing up costs yeah. of maintenance you know, going up sharply, supply of spare parts, all of these things getting getting more expensive. So on, on some level, yeah, that that will happen. And it is happening. Because if you look at the US ULCCs and why they fell off the rails last summer, <laughs> that was because they couldn't discount far enough to, to fill the planes. Sim simple as that. So they couldn't price low enough um, to fill the planes and make a profit, even in the peak season. So, you know, we will see an increase in cost base. And where I don't maybe 100% agree with what, what, what Deidre was saying. That people do value their trips. There's no question about that. We expected that. We've seen that. Uh, but perhaps the, the snapback has perhaps softened a little bit. And, and some of that discretionary travel for, for short trips and weekends and some of the VFR has probably settled down a little bit. And we're seeing a softer landing from that now. Yeah, I think I think it will be interesting um, to see how that how that pans out over the coming 12 to on, um, you know, particularly, I suppose, in the context of we all anticipated perhaps more economic turbulence than there has been. Um, and I sort of see that against the backdrop of there's been a lot, um, you know, but maybe we're getting, maybe the markets are getting more used to the fragility of, of, the, of the kind of economic position globally. Um, and it, my sense is that, that Perhaps we were thinking maybe there was going to be a global recession. We've, we've stepped back from that precipice. And, and I wonder, you know, what, what impact that will have on propensity to, to, to fly um, and disposable income. Uh, my sense is it can only be can only a, a positive. I, you know, I, I, go, go ahead, John. Uh, no, Mark, you go first. Um, I, I'm first. just saying, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if... Um, you know, you talked about the cycles, and we're, we've all been used to those cycles. It was, you know, hammered into us uh, at an early age that this industry was cyclical. Um, you know, I, I think that's probably no longer the case in the sense that if you look at the, the, the market, you know, Asia is lagging from the pandemic on the basis of they've still got their recovery curve coming, and it's going to, to, to go up, whereas some markets may be stabilizing and dropping. So, 
it's almost like we have sort of small whirlpools around the world and, and nothing seems to be thankfully um you know some of the geopolitical things we're facing don't seem to have um the huge impact that things in the past may have had on the on the global basis of these cycles so i don't know if it's become because we've become resilient um because you know economies are so interlinked um or it's because we live in a in a faster paced world where you know news is is still within you know 24 hours and we move on to the yeah. next thing but there's something I, different John, yeah john you made a good point when we were chatting about the chinese market and and how you know they're going to have to start taking extended leases aren't they they don't have positions yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, there are a, a huge number of aircraft coming off their first lease in China over the next few years, uh, and I don't think the Chinese market has quite woken up to the fact that it doesn't have enough capacity yet to come and backfill that, uh, and they're not going to get it from uh, for, from Airbus or Boeing in the next few years. So you know, we certainly expect that airlines are going to be coming and starting to talk about extensions, which is going to be an interesting dynamic for lessors in, in that position because. The, the Chinese airlines tend to try and do these things at quite short notice, whereas we now want to be going the other way. We want to be out in this market, probably more like you know 18 months or two years ahead of a lease expiry, remarketing the aircraft. Um, so what are you going to do when the airline then six months before return turns around and says, actually, we really need this aircraft? So I think there's a lot to play out in that space, and we will we will start seeing that over the next few months. And in that scenario, I mean, when it gets down, you know, it, it gets down to the last wire and, and they do that in every part of their aviation sector. They don't load their airline schedules until six weeks before, you know, the, the next season. What do you do as a lessor? Do you just hang on confident that they are going to take the lease on again? Or do you, you've got to go out there and start looking for alternate options, haven't you? Great question. You have to go out looking for alternative options. Uh, I've been in a case before where we extended the leases of aircraft and the lease extension wasn't signed until four months after the old one expired. And you're totally on a relationship play then. I mean, that, that's, it sounds crazy, but if, if an airline doesn't want to give an aircraft back, you're not in a great place in terms of trying to pull it back, especially you know, when you've got a relationship to maintain with that airline as well. Um, so, you know, you have to get out ahead of it and you have to present options and you have to tell that airline that, look, um, if you can't come up, if you can't come to the table, we're going to move that airplane um, and hope that that leads to a discussion earlier. But there are, there are going to be some issues there uh, in, in time ahead, I'm, I'm sure. And one of the things I, that, you know, I think we've all been surprised about, at least at a superficial level, is that very few airlines have really disappeared in the last four or five years you know they may have restructured slightly changed done whatever but we've not really seen any any globally known names disappearing which is a bit of a surprise and then two weeks ago we have goal filing chapter 11 and i mean they were one of the two largest airlines in uh, latin america you know um widely regarded as as best in class for many years and then suddenly they've got a problem. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things we, we did recently was, um, I think we drew up a list of, I think it was 17 carriers failed last year, mm -hmm. which was fewer than in 22. And about a third of them were in Latin America area. Now, the, I think the reasons there mainly revolved around, you know, they had a low, low level of government support during COVID, yeah. generally speaking. They've got, they had higher fuel costs, you know, currency uh, depreciations, etc. So there was a lot of things going against them, which is why we've had some of those those falling over. And I think there's there's about another four carriers. I think that stopped flying last year, but have an opportunity to to, to resurrect. So yeah, it's, the numbers are low, but I suspect they're low because we had an awful lot of government support during the during the um, the, the downtime. You know, was it two hundred billion of uh, of state aid? Yeah, sorry. Well, sorry, sorry. I was going to add two quick two things quickly to that. One, one is for an airline to fail, it has to be in somebody's interest for it to fail, right? So you need to have a bank or a creditor or somebody that says enough mm -hmm. is enough. We're stopping here. And as you're sort of coming out of COVID and there isn't so much supply of power, there simply wasn't the incentive for anybody to do that. But that that's why you kind of saw less failures. And I think particularly also last year, you've got this reverse sort of cash curve 
one of the things that really damaged airlines going into COVID wasn't so much the the grounding of airplanes per se, as it was having to return all that cash they were sitting on from people they couldn't fly. And in 2022, certainly 2023, you see the reverse of that, right? So you've got balance sheets building back up again, cash flowing. So airlines are much more able to, um, to satisfy all those deferred obligations. I, just, I think that hits the ceiling now. And for that reason, 2024 might be a little bit challenging and it will be very interesting to see what, what happens with gold. Yeah, I was John. I was saying before, um, before I think you joined us, that apparently LATAM sent a letter to some of the lessors for Gold Aircraft, offering to take those aircraft off them at a moment's notice. I mean, that's that's like vultures hovering, isn't it? Taking where the iron's hot, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah good. Oh, well, as they, as they do, you'll see if you look back at Viva, those aircraft very quickly went to Avianca and LATAM, all of them. And that everyone knows everyone in everyone knows everyone in that market, so it's just a phone call. Or I, I wonder if they were chasing the pilots with the same vigor, because that used to be the, you know, eighteen months ago we'd have been talking about pilot shortage. Um, now yeah, we're talking that, about that, and that's still there. That's still an issue. Isn't Absolutely, it? a massive but, issue. But that's the the essence of our industry. It's you know what's in the number one spot. Yeah. <laughs> At the moment, it's uh, supply. Um, some debate quality but it's it's really about supply and the you know the the, the chain is 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 simply broken no? and you know it oh. doesn't in terms of supply of new aircraft um it's a long-term game isn't it this this is not this is going to be fixed but it's it's everything Deirdre. i mean it's it's right down to you know i'm sure we've all got our individual stories but you know on our side uh, you know whether it's waiting for a landing gear or you know, something that should have been turned around uh, months ago. Um, you know, if we had, we, we, we keep spare landing gear, we keep spare engines, because it's the only way we can service our, our customers and get the aircraft out the other side. But, you know, in, in the last few weeks, when we were meeting a lot of people, we could have traded those engines, landing gears, multiple times over. Mm -hmm. uh, people asking for, for parts, it's, 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 we laugh, but it's not, it's not a funny situation. So it's always like going down the breaker's yard. And yeah, it is. What's yeah. around the back? Can I pick one of those up? It is, absolutely, John. It's the sort of, you know, end of the world syndrome. I'll take that. I'll take this. And, but uh, the question That's is good. how long it's going to be there for. And, and yeah. consensus seems to be amongst the OEMs, at least, this is through to, to 25 before it's going to be solved. Huh? And one of, the thing, one of the things I keep hearing... Um, from carriers as well is, you know, and it, it, it's a metric that, that gets thrown out quite often, is aircraft utilisation is nowhere near as high as it used to be. Um, so, you know, counterintuitively, you'd think if you've got a smaller fleet, you'd be working them even harder to, to do as much as you possibly can. But the reality is you can't because the way the networks are designed, the way the sector lengths are, whatever it happens to be, you just don't have mm. a, you don't have enough wriggle room, uh, for want of a better phrase, to to allow you to drive that utilisation up, and and all of that is just you know another one of those cost elements that ripples through to the consumer at some point. So part of that is probably driven by the fact that the wide body fleet is still quite substantially smaller than it than it was as we headed into the pandemic which in turn means you have to reshape your network if you can't have the same number of long haul banks then you can't have the same number of short haul flights feeding them so that's 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 playing to cost pressure as well and and all of those geopolitical things when you have to send an aircraft you know on an extended asian trip from europe or from north america that puts another 5 hours round trip on on that that aircraft I think also compounded though by um, narrow body aircraft that, that have longer range, you know, and, and, and appreciate that's part of the problem in terms of the manufacturing delay, but actually that's changing the structure of um, banks and waves as well, isn't it? When you've got more ability to serve markets, particularly from India, um, you know, the proportion of places that could be served um, on a direct flight rather than a stopping flight somewhere um that, that, that there's tension there isn't there in terms of how people will choose to travel in future yeah the other I mean, thing I've, I've said I've, I've flown 321s across the atlantic and didn't 
didn't worry about it too much. And I mean, the good, the good <laughs> thing is also from a, a, so from, a, a from a CO2 perspective as well. I mean, flying a, a narrow body on longer stage lengths, high density, high load factors, it gets, it gets a better rating you know, than, than you might otherwise do from a, say, an, an older wide body. So there's, I think airlines can do that you know, can do more with the fleet planning in terms of getting the right aircraft on the right routes. Um, and it's something they're going to have to do, especially as they try and try and get their fleets organised. I think I think that's one of those things that until you experience it, it there's probably a degree of fear about it, is it well, isn't it? Isn't there, you, you know, know, in terms of how far have you flown on an narrow body aircraft and yeah. was it was but it if you're as old if you if you're as old as you've um, you've positioned me dear G for this webinar, <laughs> then, um, you, you know, you may have flown with a Continental 757 from Europe to Newark when they were building their super hub in Newark. And it was, it was, it was a perfectly acceptable product. There was nothing wrong with it at all. Um, and I think, I think that is the way forward. Um, but it's also about the competitive pressure, isn't it? Of which airlines are, are savvy enough to realize that's the right aircraft, right fit. And we'll go with it compared to those who think I've got to go wide body because that's what, you know, what my travellers and my corporate traveller needs. Or, 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 or indeed my government is um, it, it is expecting me to provide as a, a as a national airline. You know, Absolutely. Which, you know, hmm. Happens quite a bit in some parts of the world, doesn't it, Mark? John, you, you remember the 7-3 that used to fly from Amsterdam to Houston? Uh, private air, 68 seat aircraft. I went nearly on that in, with my, my family. Straight from Aberdeen, Mark. Nearly, <laughs> nearly for a client had it going non stop from Aberdeen. Well, I, I um, went on that with my family. My wife was like, Is this a normal airplane for this route? And I said, Don't worry, dear, it's normal. <laughs> I, I, think we were, I think we were landing on fumes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, that that was a very niche thing and it, it yeah, worked for absolutely. a period of time. Yeah, and, then, and actually, there were a lot of airlines who were clamouring for that aircraft to do exactly the same thing for Houston. Yeah. Um, so you know, it, it worked for a while. But we're, if we're in this storm, I mean, how long? How one? How long are we in it? You know, is everyone going to be ravaged as badly by the storm as? But it's as it's actually a good storm for some. I mean, it's this is the issue. Um, so when we say it's a storm, it's for want of a better word, because you know we all know the perfect storm syndrome, but. You know, if if you look even, you know, the, the situation on the cargo market, um, okay, it's it's a negative on the, the sense of the Suez Canal um, shipping, but more will go by air freight. This is good news for, for airlines and, and cargo operators, good news for lessors with, with cargo aircraft. So the, there's many positive spin-offs out of the situation we're in. Um, so it's, it's not so much a perfect storm in, in the negative sense. But I think a lot of that stuff that, you know, could potentially be inconvenienced by the Suez situation. Um, you know, my 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 bag of tea leaves is never going to go by um, freighter, is it? Uh, you know, no. there are some depends, products. It depends products. how much you want to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well it, it, yeah. It, OK. It, I think that's it, isn't it? You know, proportionate. Yeah. But by, in addition to the journey time of two weeks, three, three weeks, and actually, in I think I read somewhere last week the context, the overall cost, it is not um, is not something that's insurmountable for for, for shippers and and ultimately suppliers. Um, you know, I think I think we shouldn't necessarily expect a big boom for cargo on on the back of that. Um, there will be some products that that may benefit, but you know, for others, it's just a, it's an additional cost to pass on to the to the consumers, isn't it, ultimately? The, the, the other really interesting dynamic with that cargo fleet right now is is the fact that the engines are in such high demand. So we, we're aware of a large number of narrow-body freighters that have parked because the owners have taken the engines off to lease them. Wow. The, sum total, the sum total of two engines is more in the market right now than, than the freighter would be. So there's not, you know, too many were converted, no doubt, and, and some of them will, will stay grounded for that reason until the market more fundamentally improves. But I, I guess, John, were you sort of making a point of how, how long this kind of stretch supply chain and yeah. supply of power might might last? <laughs> I'd be interested to hear what the guys think about that, but I mean, I'll, I'll venture a view that it's a lot longer than 2025. I Looking at, at the 
the stretch in the backlogs. I, I can't, I can't really see this writing itself until the, very much at the latter part of this decade. I don't think. Uh, you know, I just see what the guys think about that. But. I think. Yeah, uh, that, I think. I think I mentioned earlier. I think some some pundits have suggested end of the decade, which I think is probably pushing it just a bit too far because I always. Being an optimist, I always believe the manufacturers can actually get pull the finger out and get things sorted. Um, but maybe it's going to be 27, 28. But th then again, I mean, there's there's a there's a potential to overshoot as this industry, if it does want to go back into a cycle, um, where you're, yeah. you're suddenly delivering more aircraft than the market needs. Because I think people have also said that it could be. I a, can't believe a that. Like you're, slow you're down in 28 or something. You're, Sorry, you're, John. Saying, you're the voice of optimism. Yeah, you're saying I this love is it. going to see me out, Eddie. I can't believe it. This is, <laughs> this is, this is my last aviation crisis, according to, <laughs> to Deirdre's reflections on my age and maturity. You don't get it once anymore, do you, John? Any more cycles like that? Do you know what? No, the one thing about this industry, no two days are the same, are they? There is always oh, that's very really true. Mark, when do you think? Look, I, I think... Um... You know, even as a as a Scot, where in theory we're supposed to be more pessimistic than optimistic, um, or more realistic, shall I say? I, I still don't see um, the downturn. I thought, you know, the geopolitical situation would would have had an impact. It hasn't, um, or not in any large way. So, and and coming from the OEM side fairly recently, I know how severe the supply chain issue is across the board. And it's so fickle. Um, so I think we're at least uh, agree with with Eddie. We're, we're a few years out, and of course the OEMs are going to talk up a solution. But if you look back at history, they've been talking up the solution for the last three years. You know, and not and not out. delivered on time to exactly. any of those solutions. Exactly. And if you look at you know the promises on production, <clears throat> okay, maybe it'll flow through from you know second half of this year. But at the moment, like for like Airbus and Boeing. They're not delivering more airplanes than they were this time last year. Um, so it's going to take time to, to to correct. And, I mean, you know, we know the Boeing issues. Um, they've got more than enough press. Um, but Airbus, um, they seem to have been able to get away with it a little bit more, don't they, in terms of deliveries and, and public awareness of, of non-performance. I think they're hiding a little behind... You know, the Pratt & Whitney is the, the source of the problem. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm quite surprised that that's not taken a, a larger sort of um, prominent view in the marketplace because it is really quite substantial when you dig. Yeah? I you know, I, I just, if I was, as I said to John yesterday, if I was a shareholder in Airbus, I'd be screaming, why are you not producing more aircraft? This is the moment you've got to get them out there sort of thing. Safely, of course. But but you don't see that urgency or any great shift in momentum, do you? I think they would do if they could, but you yeah. know there are there are limitations to that. I mean, uh, you know, they, they they need TFM to step up and fill the gap that Pratt and Whitney is kind of leaving behind a little bit. That involves significant investment on the CFM side. It's not done overnight, and there's there's risk to them in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. Plus, Airbus they let a lot of people go during the pandemic, and mm -hmm. I think people close to the, the Airbus supply chain will will tell you they, they have issues there with uh, with experience and resources, uh, you know, quality, quality, quality issues, you know, delivering on time, being able to hit the ramp up targets, they're massive challenges for them. So I, I think they're trying, but it's going to be going to be very difficult. It has to be done in a measured, a measured way, doesn't it? And you, you know, the, the I think the lesson for all of us through the pandemic has been to sort of appreciate those unexpected um, situations that have arisen be because of exactly that sort of issue. Um, letting a workforce go and trying to, to, to build it back is um, not without huge challenge. John, I don't think, John, uh, I was going to call you old John there and I felt that was a bit harsh. So, <laughs> John, no, you have, you have now. I've done it now. Right. Um, well, what was your, what's your take? Is, is this the end of the decade or is it, is, is, um, is there light at the end of the tunnel sooner? No, there isn't light at the end of the tunnel. I think it, you know, I, there, all of the challenges we face are not solvable overnight. And they're not so solvable. And the biggest one, which we've only just started to really touch on, is, you know, just experience. 
people's experience and knowledge that has left the industry in all sorts of areas in the last three or four years is is a real real worry and you, i remember last summer there was you know the big meltdown of the um, faa's ATC, atc system in the northeast of new york and one of one of the you know one of the great learnings from that was you only know how to handle those types of experiences once you've been in the middle of them. Mm -hmm. So all of these new air traffic controllers were literally sitting there, you know, like, I've got to be ultra cautious, I can't do that, I'm not going to, my flow limits are going down, I'm not going to accept any more traffic. Whereas a seasoned 30 year veteran would have said, oh, you know, that's a breeze, let's put another five in there, etc. And that's what we've got in the whole industry now. The experience that we had is, just doesn't exist. Um, and and that is going to take at least another four years, perhaps longer. Um, but I'm still going to be here. I'm not going to give up. Don't worry. I'll, I'll still be here. Be, be as cynical, cynical we'll, as we'll ever. Hold you to that. We'll hold you to that. about all of these things. <laughs> On that note, um, unfortunately, we do have to draw um, to today's conversation to an end. Um, thank you so much to our uh, to, to our guests for your fascinating insights. Um, I, I feel like we probably could have carried on talking for at least another hour, but conscious that um, you all have uh, other other demands on your time and, and things to do. So a big thank you from us for, for your participation. It's been uh, a pleasure from our side and um, hopefully um, you'll uh, you'll come back and join us again soon. and Maybe we can pick up the threads of the of the conversation. Maybe um, in two years time. <laughs> when you'll still be here <laughs> i'll still be here i might have changed my shirt but i'll still be here <laughs> thank you everyone thank you everyone yeah thank you thank you thank you bye-bye thank you bye bye, bye. Thank you. bye, -bye.